I'm Aronetta Pierce. My good friend, Dr. Maya Angelou, is celebrated as one of the great authors of contemporary literature and has earned the right to be known as a Renaissance woman. Her accomplishments are truly remarkable, for she is known worldwide for her work as a poet, historian, actress, best-selling author, educator, playwright, producer, director, and civil rights activist. Dr. Angelou was appointed to a lifetime position as Professor of American Studies at Wake Forest University in 1981. And in 1993, she became recognized as only the second poet in U.S. history commissioned to recite original work at the presidential inauguration. I invite you now to hear her words of compassionate wisdom. I've been very fortunate to have two friends here, a family actually, the Pierces and uh, who are African-American. And through them, I've met a large uh, group of African-Americans. They have also in their group of family friends, white Americans. So I've met a lot of Anglos through them. And of course, some Spanish-speaking folks. Uh, I go to a restaurant called La Magrita. And uh, I notice that when I've been in town, if, uh, if I haven't done anything public, a performance, a concert, these columnists will say, Maya Angelo is in town. If you want to see her, go to La Magrita, and she'll be singing with the, uh, with the, the musicians, which is true. So people are glad when I come in. I, I, I have noticed I guess much to my surprise, because it doesn't happen in many southwest cities or western cities, I have noticed a beautiful blending of uh, African Americans and, and Latinos that I'm sorry to say uh, is rare, and it makes for a wonderful ambiance in this city. I mean, the air is sweeter. The friction is not there. Some years ago, at the encouragement of Alex Haley and the Pierces, I came, I took a, an apartment, a Riverside apartment, for three months. And so I would walk a lot. I did some good writing here. And I found wherever I went, I was very welcome. And it wasn't because I was, my face was that familiar, for it was that long ago. But I went to a Polish restaurant and was very welcomed, very welcomed, and to uh, uh, Latino restaurants and Anglo. Wherever I went, I didn't feel that moment that very few whites know about, but all blacks know about, and most Latinos and Jews can know about it, and Native Americans, that when you walk into a place blithely, feeling very good, and all of a sudden there's the hesitation, because one feels an invisible but very real resistance to one's presence. I don't find that. In, uh, in San Antonio. I've not for the last 20 years. The only liberty anyone will ever have will be the liberty one earns in one's brain. It is only here that one can be free. That is not to say that legislation cannot have its, its impact on one's liberty. But legislation cannot uh, encourage me to know more about you, to know more about people who don't look like me. Legislation cannot do that, but education can. Education helps me as a student and as a professor to be able to say human beings are more alike than we are unalike. Ah. With education, I can read Carlos Fuentes, 
Octavio Paz. I can read Kinzaburu Oe, the Japanese writer, Hakobo Abe. I can read James Baldwin and Norman Mailer, Sonia Sanchez and Emily Dickinson. Look, suddenly I know, my goodness, how oh, surprised. Somebody else felt that way. So then if I can remove the xenophobic from my, that is the stranger, hating of strangers and fearing of strangers from my understanding, ah, then I can say, okay, so, um, so we are alike. This is really important for the educator and the young person or old person searching for education. We need to know that all human beings all over the world want exactly the same things, principally in Paris, France, in Paris, Texas. If people want jobs, they want good jobs. They want to be paid a little more than their worth not enough to embarrass them, but just to make them feel, I'm getting over. People want, who want children, want healthy children. I mean in Birmingham, Alabama, or Birmingham, England, people uh, want safe streets all over the world, Peking, Ohio, or Beijing, China, all over the world. Everybody wants to love somebody. And everybody wants to have the unmitigated gall to accept love in return. Everybody. Everybody wants some place to party on Saturday night. Everybody. So if you, if you understand that, and you can only understand that through education. That is the only way. There's an old... Um, African-American song, a Christian song. The statement is, when it looked like the sun wasn't going to shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the clouds. Well, you see, UTSA is a rainbow in the clouds for people who never thought they could get to a university. People who are the first of their line to enter an institution of higher education. People who never, I mean, just two generations ago had the idea that, oh, they go to university, not my kind. So the rainbow in the clouds is better than the rainbow in the sky. We know that suns and moons and stars and all sorts of illuminations are always in the firmament. But clouds can so lower and lower that the viewer cannot see the light. But to have the clouds encapsulate a rainbow means that at the worst of times, there's a possibility of seeing hope. So for the young poor white boy from, uh, not from the city of San Antonio, but way from the country, for the poor young black girl from the country, the poor Latino, poor uh, Native American, who, I mean, the university, gosh, just to put my foot on the step, and now I'm being welcomed in, and not only welcomed in, but accommodated. You mean to tell me? When I speak here in San Antonio, uh, Henry Cisneros, when he was mayor, made me a, a volunteer mayor. When I speak here, I, note, I always speak in Spanish, so I'm in Spanish. Uh, and I notice that young people will bring their grandparents, their parents and grandparents to the university whenever I speak, wherever I am. And because in some places, there's no other way for the 
the older person, the parent, to get to the university steps unless the young people bring them. No, and there's no reason to bring them if somebody doesn't speak Spanish. So I notice here more than ever that older people wander around in the university, around the corridors. I don't know. They're not searching for it for themselves, but they're familiarizing themselves with the atmosphere. What did you do today, Papa? I went to the university. It's great. Wonderful. It's very difficult to maintain standards. It's imperative that we set standards, however. And, then, and imperative that we do our best to maintain the standard and even raise the bar. But I think that this university means to do that. To, it has set the standard 33 years ago, obviously. And when one sees the increase, not only of uh, entrance into the university, but the increase of graduates and uh, the increase of people getting degrees, especially minority people getting degrees in the sciences and uh, in education. One sees the serious attempt to maintain the standard and even to raise the bar. It's not only, you see, it's interesting. It's not only good for the university and the students, but uh, like calls to like. So people in business who see what is happening at the university themselves try to set higher standards. People in the arts see that, what is happening with the university, and are encouraged to raise the people in religion. Everybody is affected positively or negatively by what happens in a community. And when the large uh, body of people are in an institution of higher education, and the, that institution has a commitment to excellence. It raises the bar and, and elicits excellence from every corner of the community. Somebody is going to help us to rid ourselves of this blight of racism and sexism and ageism and ignorance. She may be uh, the next entrant into UTSA. Somebody's going to help us to eradicate AIDS and help us to find how to avoid prostate cancer and breast cancer. He may be a second year student at the university. Somebody. So he may be a Hispanic, she may be Anglo, he may be African American, he, she may be Native American. Somebody's going to do it. So this university, by setting the standard and being honest and sincere and loyal to the standard of excellence, has a chance to be the the fulcrum, the, uh, the source out of which comes our next Nobel Prize winners in 10 years, 15 years, 20. Everything we do to help young men and women liberate themselves from their ignorance. I give uh, the convocation at Duke University and have every year for 14 years. And one of the things I say there is, I sing a song, lay down my burden 
And then I say, young men and women, you have entered this institution of higher education. Here, you may lay down your burden. Here, in this very chapel, you may lay down the burden of ignorance that maybe you inherited, or your family always, we always believed that they were those and those were them and that was that and we were we. You may lay it down here. This is what the institution is for. And this is what obviously UTSA is, is moving upward, upward on that ladder of that mountain of liberation. Since life is our most precious gift, and since as far as we can be absolutely certain, it's given to us to live but once. We should so live that we will not regret years of useless virtue and inertia and timidity and ignorance. And we can say all my conscious life has been dedicated to the most noble cause in the world, the liberation of the human mind and spirit, beginning with my own through participating in my own education. And I, Maya Angelou, I'm grateful to UTSA. I'm grateful to the faculty, to the board, to all the parents who send their children there. I'm grateful to you, to the men and women who support by intelligence and education the intelligence and education of our young tomorrows. I thank you. Mm -hmm.